Welcome, welcome to the Mysterious Book Emporium. Last time, the rebel army had just captured the city of Guerin, but while the army is gathering strength, the relationship between our main heroes is starting to weaken. Will Merrick's infatuation with Catriel be the downfall of the rebels? Why don't you take a seat as we continue on with part three of The Stolen Throne, chapters nine through 12. Chapter nine. The chapter opens up with the city of Guerin cleaning up after the battle, many of the citizens starting to feel comfortable about the rebel presence. After Loghain's confession of love to Rowan ended disastrously, he began to rethink his position in the army and leaving the remains of his father behind. At least, that's what he's telling himself. He spent the whole night collecting his old things and readying a horse to leave, hoping to make it out before camp awoke. But it seems that word has made it to an injured Merrick who has rushed to his friend on crutches. Merrick is upset, calling out Loghain on his explanation, and that he feels that Loghain is just running away, although he is unsure of what from. At this point, Rowan joins in to find Loghain, both her and Merrick make pleas for Loghain to stay, and that his battle plans have taken the army where they are today. When it all doesn't seem to be working, Merrick struggles to his knees and makes a passionate plea for Loghain to stay, if not for the army, for him and their friendship. Loghain eventually accepts and says that he will stay, and happy with his answer, Merrick runs off to go find something. Alone, Rowan confronts Loghain on the real reason he is leaving. After what seemed like forever, she spoke, her voice pained and hesitant. Were you leaving because of me? He stopped. I was leaving because I was the lesser man, according to you. She flinched. I shouldn't be the only reason you stay. You're not. He turned towards her, his gaze hard. He is. When Merrick quickly comes back with Arendorn, they tell Loghain that all this time they have discussed and agreed to offer the position of commander to Loghain, making him second in command of the rebel army. Loghain is surprised but eagerly accepts the promotion, and with that, Loghain drops to his knees and, despite protests, gives an oath to Merrick that he will serve him. Chapter 10 We jump to Guerin Manor during its first time being used to host the royal court. Due to the rebels' position in Guerin, they have been able to hold the city for some time now. Thankfully for the rebels, the sea traffic has still been open, which became the main source of supplies for them. During the royal court, nobles from all over Ferelden have gathered, many who have never marched with the rebels, some that even turned them away. Merrick is hopeful that he will be able to collect some much-needed supplies from these nobles, although Loghain, as usual, is skeptical. Merrick stands up to give a speech and tells the nobles his plans for the next major step for regaining his crown. Megrin's biggest strength is the highly trained chevaliers from Orlais, but he has to pay for them. The plan is to go and steal the massive fund that will be handed over to Orlais for troops. Without this, the king would either have to outrage the people even more with large taxes, or beg Orlais for mercy, which also leaves an opening for them to attack the weakened army. To take the money, which is being held in a remote city called West Hill, they will have to take a majority of their army to it leaving Guerin defenseless. This obviously upsets the nobles as it's one, an extremely risky plan, and two, if they fail, the rebels basically lose everything. While the audience titters about, upset and confused over the plan, Loghain passionately interjects that it's not as crazy as it sounds, and the risks like these are the only reason the rebel army has gotten as far as it has. And here, Loghain pulls Catriel from the crowd because it's her information that makes this plan possible. She and a few others will be put into West Hill as spies and will open the town's large gates for the army to come in and control the area. Immediately, the reader knows that this is going to go terribly due to our knowledge that she is a spy from Orlais, but that bit is for later. Anyway, one noble stands up and argues with Loghain, calling Catriel worthless. This angers Merrick, who comes to her defense and grasps her hands in front of the whole court, stating that the Maker brought her to the rebels for a reason and he believes in her. When that same noble goes to argue again, threatening Merrick in the process, Loghain murders him in front of the whole court and threatens the others as well. But they're not talking to just anyone. They argue with the King of Ferelden. After all of this, the rebels get what they wanted, more men for their army, which increases their army almost by half. They aren't that worried about word spreading too fast of their plane because the nobles on the court will be staying some time in Guerin. The only downside is that Merrick was forced to stay out of the upcoming battle as it would risk too much for the Ferelda nobles to be comfortable with. 
We now skip to Severin in Denerim. He's visiting Megrin, who is sick in bed, to tell him the news. Mother Bronarch is also there, and Megrin is still upset that she had spoken with Merrick previously. Severin informs him that the plan is a success and that the rebels plan to attack West Hill, where a large army will be waiting for them. Megrin, annoyed with it all, declares that he has changed his mind and that instead of Merrick being captured and brought to Denerim, he wants him dead. This annoys Severin, as that would have been a lot easier to do and probably not as expensive. Mother Bronart claims that it's better this way, as it means that people won't have to witness their savior paraded in irons and killed publicly, and might be better for Megrin's local popularity. Severin leaves, making a note to fake not being able to heal his cold just a little bit longer in small revenge towards the king. Chapter 11 we skip in time to Catriel in West Hill. She walks the upper floors of the West Hill Keep, which have been shut away from the public after years of disuse. We get a small summary on how Catriel got to be so close to the rebel army despite being a spy. She actually started in West Hill before, befriending those sympathetic to the rebels, and then she seduced a guardsman to get introduced to Arl Byron and gaining his trust by running tasks. His final task, getting her an audience with the prince. For a week since she got here, she quietly left notes for the Orlesians in the area to find and subdue the other rebel spies. While she did feel some regret for this, this was her job. We get Catriel's actual thoughts on Merrick, how surprised she is at his sincerity and kindness. She's used to Orlais, where most people have dark secrets hiding in the shadows, not for Eldon, where people are just what they seem. Whatever was happening between her and Merrick, there was feelings on both sides. She meets her contact in the upper floors of the keep, a Ravani man who confirms the plan. Soon the doors will open and the rebel army will attack, and a nearby Arlesian army will trap them within the keep. The man also tells Catriel that the deal has changed. Merrick won't be taken hostage, he will be killed on the battlefield. This upset her, to which the man warns her to obey Severin's orders. Catriel gently reminds him that she isn't his servant. She was paid to deliver the prince, she has done so, and so now the business relationship has ended. The man goes to kill her, to which she easily avoids and kills him herself. At this point, she can go. Her job has ended, but as she listens to the sounds of the front gate opening, she races out to go find Merrick. We flip to Loghain, watching West Hill from afar with his men. He thinks that things have gone amazingly smooth with their plan, and it disturbs him. Things never go well. His suspicions are only confirmed when Rowan is seen charging up to Loghain with terror in her eyes. She informs him that the camp has been attacked and Merrick could be harmed. Loghain and Rowan begin to ride off to find Merrick, but his lieutenant stops him, asking him why he is leaving them all behind. Both Loghain and Rowan know that without the two of them, the battle is most likely doomed. But without Merrick, everything is doomed anyway. He gives his men orders to charge after the Arl does, guilty about leaving Arl Rendorn to himself. We then cut to Merrick, injured and riding frantic on a horse towards the unknown. He had just barely been able to escape the attack. His horse trips, breaking its leg and throwing Merrick into a nearby tree, causing a concussion. Eight Malaysian men find him quickly, surrounding him to attack. Rage wells up inside Merrick and he's actually able to defend himself long enough for Loghain and Rowan to find him. The three are able to fight off most of the men, but more come on horseback, except they are cut off by Catriel on her horse able to take out the remaining three men by surprise. After they are momentarily safe, Merrick faints. Catriel and Rowan come to his aid, Catriel having brought bandages, while Loghain begins to question Catriel's timing. She responds that her coming now isn't an accident, that she has found out about the Orlesian trap. The three gather up Merrick and try to make their way to the battlefield, only to be lost in the smoke and confusion they find. The dead they find seem to be mostly made of rebel men, and they were defeated so badly the remaining men have apparently retreated to parts unknown. Chapter 12 Rowan sits on a smuggler cart that belongs to a castless dwarf who is eyeing her up. She had caught a ride to gather information on what had happened in the battle. After getting what she wanted, she thanks them and heads off to their camp. For the past nine days, Merrick has been mostly sleeping and recovering from his injuries. Loghain had been the major food provider and Catriel tending to Merrick's every need. Rowan dislikes being with Catriel alone, considering her relationship with Merrick. 
She is unsure if the two have continued to see each other after the night she had witnessed and is mixed between wanting to know and never wanting to know at all. He had never been interested in anyone before, so why was Merrick doing this now? As Rowan and Catriel talk, Catriel keeps referring to her as my lady. Rowan asks her to stop as one, it could blow their cover, and two, considering recent events, she doesn't really need to. This actually angers Catriel. You all do exactly the same thing, she said. Even the commander, Loghain. It's as if you believe you are doing me a favor by pretending that we are equals. Her tone was crisp and disapproving. But we are not. I'm not your servant, but I will always be an elf. To pretend otherwise is insulting. Rowan asks her about herself, to which Catriel reveals that she's from Orlay. When asked why she would join the rebels, Catriel gets upset with her. While Rowan believes that something horrible must have happened to her before, we know that Catriel is just worried that she's going to be caught. But one thing to take from their exchange is that the two women are going to refuse to get along with one another. Eventually, Merrick wakes, Loghain comes back, to which Rowan tells them the news that she has heard. Catriel takes the rabbits that Loghain has caught and goes to skin them, stating that she wishes to feel useful, and she heads for the river. Alone, Rowan then goes on to tell the news. While the army was routed, some still survive, and they're going to be heading back to Gwerin. But Arl Rendorn has been killed, his head on a spike in Denrim. But Merrick is supposed to be killed as well. The three decide that they need to head back to Gwerin before the Elysian army makes it there, but after some discussing, they find that all the options they have either take them into the hands of the Elysians, or they don't have the time or means to do so. Unsettled, the three pause at what this means. Without the major heads of command, the rebels are going to fail. Merrick yells at the other two that if they had just stayed, there could have been a chance that the rebel army wasn't just getting him the throne, it was getting Megrin off of it. Rowan and Loghain argue with him for a bit, but seeing how much despair Merrick is in, Loghain agrees that he won't come to his rescue ever again, and Rowan can tell that he means it. While Merrick asks the same thing of Rowan, she slaps him. Catriel eventually comes back with fresh rabbit meat, having heard them yelling from afar, and offers a suggestion. They passed a dwarven pillar not too long ago, an ancient way into the deep roads. She tells them that Gwerin used to be a dwarven outpost for trade and would be connected to the deep roads. While the roads are infested with darkspawn and some parts collapse, the only possibility of them making it in time would be to take the deep roads. Rowan and Loghain are both suspicious on how she knows so much, but Merrick believes in that small chance, and soon, the four will be heading into the deep. Discussion. So let's start out with thanking the artist of the week, Flukas. He actually sent in a few other pieces as well, but I just couldn't fit them into the summary section easily, but I've linked them down below if you want to look at them. So to start this discussion, let's talk about something Anana brought up. And now I ship Loghain and Merrick. Thanks, Gator. I try not to let my shipper side to dominate me, but when he writes it so well, great, now I'm stuck in rare pair hell. Hope there are some more shippers in this book club and that they will produce some content for the ship. There is so much potential for inks and fix it fix, but now I'm starting to get why people change their mind about Loghain after this novel. It's hard to hate someone you ship. And look, I know some of you may roll your eyes, but I'm kind of sort of on with on and on this one. I wouldn't say it's canon and that Loghain has feelings for Merrick, but the way the relationship is written, it just seems that there's this question hanging in the air. It's, it's kind of hard to describe. Maybe like both me and Anana and whoever else is into this is just making it up. I don't know. But this question is like that maybe if something had turned out different, then who knows what could have happened? Question mark. Anyway, in chapter 10, we have someone stating the current date, 899 Blessed. I will spoil for you now that while previously we had gone through around three years fairly quickly in the novel, the rest of the novel going forward is going to be mostly set within the rest of this year. Also, hey, remember in the last video I mentioned that the nation Calabria they mentioned is supposed to be Antiva? Well, I forgot they just mentioned Antiva by name in this chapter. I am sure why this is, honestly. I wonder if at one point they were two different things and then they just got smashed together into one big Antiva, or it really is just a glaring editing error. 
Anana again mentions at the meeting of Guerin, there are seeds of what will become Loghain in Origins. He kills that ban in cold blood and doesn't mind what other people think of him, because in his eyes, he's done the right thing. But still, he does it all for Merrick. The more I read it, the more I can't understand Ostagar. Well, I understand Ostagar itself, but sacrificing Caitlyn? This is something I want you all to keep in mind as we go forward. Look for scenes that show Loghain's development from the troubled boy in the wilds just trying to survive to the hunted man willing to dirty his hands for the right cause. In some way, I sort of believe the catalyst to this is Rowan's rejection. He took that so hard, and afterwards he just pours himself into his position in the rebel army. As for why he did what he did at Ostagar, it's at least how I see it. If we jump forward to a bit to that last chapter and Loghain's promise to Merrick, that he's not going to save Merrick ever again. I think that kind of means that he won't save Merrick over for Reldon, and I think that is what happens to Caelan. Loghain honestly truly believes that throwing his men into the Darkspawn is a death sentence to his men, and that's not really what Merrick would want, probably not even what Caelan would want, so he just gives up and quits the field. Keep in mind that most of the troops in Ferelden and all of the wardens in Ferelden were at the Battle of Ostagar. If Loghain did go in and fight, but they all failed anyway, that would leave Ferelden completely defenseless in the face of a blight, which Loghain wasn't even believing was there. There's also mixings of like, what if this is an Elysian plot and blah 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 blah, so there is a bit of paranoia in there, but I, I think overall this is honestly what Loghain thought would be best for the country. And he made that promise to do what's best for the country and not for Merrick. So it's not really that he hates, you know, the, the child of Merrick and Rowan because he wanted to be with Rowan or kind of the Severus Snape type of thing. I think this is just he's take, keeping his promise to Merrick to do what's best for Ferelden. Anyway, towards the end of chapter 10, it talks about magical cures for common colds. I, not much to say here, but I just think it's interesting to think that magic can kill bacteria and not just heal broken bones or men's sliced skin. I guess my thought process is I wonder if a healing cold spell is similar to a cleaning spell as both are focusing on disinfecting. I also wonder how the magic differentiates between good bacteria for the body and like the ones causing the sickness. And could it be possible that if you're an inexperienced healer, could you actually do a lot of harm by killing a lot of the bacteria in your gut? Or alternatively, is the magic like speeding up the healing process? Does that like age the body as it speeds it up? Or is it like bolstering the immune system? Can you bolster it too much and then cause an autoimmune disease? I don't know. I have questions. <laughs> Megavar sent me a Twitter PM saying this. Why are Val Chavot's circle mages such dicks? Seriously, we've seen several male Elysian mages so far, and they've all behaved like sociopaths. What is it about that circle that makes them rapists and killers whenever went out in the world? I skipped over it in the summary, but in the last part of chapter 10, it mentions that Severin had been embarrassed by his peers in the Valshevo circle because the three mages died in the Battle of Guerin. Which, by the way, I think this particular circle is either small and unique to the novel, or is the major Elysian circle in Val Rayo the White Spire that ended up being renamed later in the series. So, fun facts, I don't know what Val Chavo is. To be honest, I think the creepy mages have more to do with Severin than all the mages that the circle being creepy. Uh, the two mages we really get to know are so similar that I would be willing to bet that Severin just requested like his friends to come along and that all his friends are creepy because he just wanted to get someone he trusted to get the job done. And so when he trusts someone who's a lot like him, not only in ability, but probably in creepiness as well. But that's just my guess. Maybe the Valshevo circle is just really fucked. In chapter 11, it mentions ghosts, and it brings up something that is sort of weird in Thetis and ghosts, in that a lot of people in Thetis don't believe in ghosts. This sounds stupid considering that it's a well-known fact that demons, spirits, magic, and much, much more are a constant threat to daily life, but in Thetis, ghosts and spirits aren't interchangeable words. Spirits are emotions made so strong in the faith that they begin to have a sort of will, these spirits can actually mimic others' thoughts and emotions and even forms, but they just mimic. Ghosts are the souls of the dead, and it kind of depends on their religion, but at least the Chantry souls of the dead cross the Fade and into the hands of the Maker. They, they, it's a one-way trip. They don't really stop. The dead don't come back. 
if you know anything about Harry Potter, it's it's sort of like the portraits in that universe. You can paint portraits of the dead and they come to life and they can talk like the dead and whatever, but they just act and talk like the dead. They aren't actually that person. They don't have any secret knowledge. They, they can't even really remember memories, if I'm remembering my Harry Potter lore correctly. But it's kind of the same deal as that. So this is a small detail, but it mentions that the colors of the Orlesian army are purple. Which is interesting, considering that the Orlesian colors we see in Dragon Age Inquisition are mostly blue. But on like that same line of thinking, I wonder if Orlesian army colors depends on the ruler. While Selene's troops are blue, we see Gaspard to be red. Perhaps Megrin has chosen purple. While Rowan talks to the dwarf, he calls her a cloud head. I'm just pointing this out because I don't think I've heard this slur used anywhere else in the series. From a quick Google, I've only found it used in promotional material for the Dragon Age Origins Castless Dwarf Origin. Not actually in the game, just in promotional material. But after that, I haven't been able to find anything else for it. From Anana again, I'm wondering, elves play the significant part in the rebellion, like Logan's Night Elves. Also, Merrick seems idyllic and free from prejudice against them. How come after he starts ruling Ferelden, he doesn't emancipate them in any way? As a reward for help? Even the small part of them? I don't think the situation of elves is significantly different in Ferelden than other parts of Thetis, but with Merrick's attitude, it should be. We will learn later that Merrick does have some ideas to elevate the elves in some way, but remember that Ferelden's political system is unique. While Merrick will be the king, he still has to answer to the nobles in the area. We've already seen a few loyal Ferelden nobles not have the same outlook on elves as Merrick. So much in Ferelden needs to change currently that I would bet that the elves just sort of fell to the wayside and were forgotten, if Merrick even really thought about it at all. Like, this is just the way he's used to. You know? Maybe he didn't even think of helping them a little bit. But just look at what happened in Dragon Age Origins if you played as a city elf warden. The elves in the alienage are given a representation in the landsmeet, and they do prosper for some time in the alienage, until poor humans that are surrounding them are outraged by this and riot, and they usually murder the elven band depending on who is picked. There needs to be a movement larger than just Merrick and the Crown, and even his elven mistress, or the warden, the elven warden, whoever it is, it needs to be widespread. And it would be interesting that if you played an elven warden or an elven inquisitor, if the world kind of begins to soften to the ideas of elven equality. Which, speaking of elves, Makovar says, I feel it's strange to find out that Loghain spent years commanding a unit of elves in the war against the Orlesians. How could someone who clearly valued them as an asset and lived alongside them, even elevating them to the status of a fully recognized independent unit in the rebel army, later turn to selling them as slaves just to fund his civil war? It shows just how unbelievably drastic the change in character was from him in the years leading up to Dragon Age Origins. I completely agree. I find it somehow worse that in the opening of the City Elf Origin, you come across these little elven kids playing as human heroes because there are no elven heroes. Except that there are. Let's not even mention Garahel, the elven hero of the fourth bite, but just focus on the Night Elves. The Night Elves would have been the perfect game for these kids to play. Something local and obtainable. But it's all been forgotten about for some reason. Help many of the elders in this alienage should remember them even. Some might even be them, but no one ever mentions it. It's like the night elves were completely forgotten about. Either this is by design of the writers, or the writers just kind of forgot about the night elves when going to the city origin. I would like to believe it's by design because if it's just, you know, a lapse in, you know, judgment, forgetting, that kind of sucks. But whatever, you do you. And as we end this episode, why don't we update the Stolen Throne Square? The two major updates here are with Catriel and Rowan. Rowan still loves Merrick, but is just so, 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 so upset with him and is just so hurt by his actions, she isn't sure how or if she should confront him about it. While she did try to give an earnest attempt at being civil with Catriel, their conversation in the woods steeled Rowan to never truly accept her. For Catriel, we learn that she's beginning to develop feelings for Merrick and doesn't seem quite sure what to do with those yet. She also is paranoid that the others will find out about her as a spy because I think she correctly knows that she will be killed if they knew. I'm not even sure Catriel knows Rowan and Merrick are betrothed, but I do think she senses Rowan's feelings for Merrick, so her paranoia and her protectiveness over Merrick are going to cause some friction in the foreseeable future between these two. 
And with that, thank you to everyone who submitted entries, and I look forward to what you guys come up with next time. Our next section will consist of chapters 13 through 16, and please send me your comments, artwork, videos, literally anything by May 6, 2018. Either comment below, send me an email at gildrathon at gmail.com, tweet at gildrathon on Twitter, or PM user Gillanon on Reddit. Dress your all.